And thank you very much for uh, taking time from this nice Saturday. You know, it's a gorgeous day out there, and uh, thanks for taking the time to come here. Um, I'm a non-invasive cardiologist by training, and I went to Penn State, both for undergrad and for medical school, and uh, then subsequently I did my medicine and cardiology training at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And I've been in the Lehigh Valley since 2004, uh, practicing initially cardiology and doing vein venous work uh, for varicose veins for the past six to seven years. So today's topic with, with this aging expo is successful aging. This is not a new topic by any means. Successful aging has been talked about for a long time. Uh, there was a, um, I guess I just should point out the disclaimer that this is not a substitute for medical treatment and advice and, or self-directed therapy. Um, successful aging, this book was published in the 1980s by, by two doctors. And it took some time to catch on until the boomers got older. And now there's a big focus on as we get into our 60s and beyond, how do we maintain our physical, our general health, our mental well-being um, as we get older. And when you look something up in a place like Wikipedia, which is now the, the ultimate source for everything for everybody, um, this is one of the first things that pop up. Well, there has been different views on successful aging. These are photos. The one on your left is a traditional picture of how we're supposed to age in a graceful fashion as we get older. Um, and of course, the one on the right, maybe it's the, I, has a flavor of the 1970s or so in it, maybe New York or something like that. There's all different views on aging. But today, across the world, these are just random pictures that people are working well into their 50s, 60s, and beyond. And people are helping take care of their family. They're working full time. And uh, this, this is important in all cultures, uh, staying active. And all of these ladies are working full time. In the book, Successful Aging, is tackled in a, a three-prong approach. Living free of disability or disease lets you live a higher quality of life. And by doing so, you can interact more with others. There's more time for you, your family, and friends. Another part of the circle here is maintaining a high cognitive level of functioning, staying sharp in the brain. Uh, and as Dr. Goldberg um, talked about just briefly, he said the word chi. Uh, which is the energy and positive energy that he focuses on when treating with acupuncture, chi goes from head to toe, and it's the energy that you can um, uh, foster by doing certain things we'll talk about. And it's also helpful to know that word for a Scrabble game with your kids, to, to know that QI is chi. Um, and, um, so, and keeping this high physical ability lets the body stay healthy and avoid um, sickness and disease. And lastly, people who are interacting regularly with others, they have more significant relationships. They report themselves to be happier um, than those who are isolated. And so when you put all three of these things together, you get the intersection in the middle of, I think, what is defined as successful aging for many people. This is a common slide. We're born, we learn to walk, we stay walking, we get older. And as we get older, there's a natural decline, back, spine, hunching, leaning forward, needing a cane or assistance, the key is to stay walking. Walking is tremendously important. There's a simple uh, statement a physician friend of mine just said, the longer you walk, the longer you will keep walking. So it's very important to maintain activity, regardless of how many problems you have, disease states you have, how many pills you're taking, walking is tremendously important. And it's nice to sit down on a park bench and enjoy the scenery once in a while. But I'm sure that they're taking a break before they get back to walking again. So you definitely want to be doing more of what's on the right than the one on the left. And walking keeps the blood circulating. It's very important. You know, it's just, I tell, I tell my patients, like, hey, listen, it's like your body's like an old car. You can't park it in the driveway too long. You got to keep it running once in a regular while because we can't replace everything from head to toe but walking keeps the circulation going. It's very difficult to understate or overstate the importance of walking because um, 
Walking is so important that the American Heart Association has a whole web page devoted to just that with many tabs and links and uh, trying to get uh, you involved in your community. There are groups, park or whatever, or just ideas as to how to start. Um, you can go on to the, uh, the AHA website and find it easily. Walking is so important that studies and decades of research has been done on it and I don't think we talk about it enough in our medical visits. Unfortunately with time pressures we have only 20, 30 or 40 minutes sometimes to talk about all of this and it's hard to tackle everything in one session. Walking has been shown to help coronary artery disease both in the prevention as well as if you have established coronary artery disease and you have something called angina where your chest hurts when you walk too much walking actually will help that because it raises your threshold for, um, uh, for, for your endurance. You'll be able to go further and further even if there is no improvement in the blockages. Um, walking helps stroke probably because it helps lower blood pressure which is the third point on there. Um, this mic is sliding down and just make sure it doesn't okay it's fine. Um, walking keeps your blood pressure down directly both from probably for combination from keeping your weight maintained but also the activity of walking using the large muscles of your legs and hips keeps the blood vessels dilated which is important that's what keeps the blood pressure down low if as we age hardening of the blood vessels called atherosclerosis naturally happens the vessel walls thicken our vessels get smaller and tighter to get the same blood flow through the body the heart has to jack up the blood pressure to get the same blood going well if you can do anything medications if necessary but like walking to keep the blood vessels dilated you'll actually have better circulation from head to toe and as you're walking you burn sugar which is very important in the control of diabetes hyperlipidemia cholesterol problems triglycerides you're actually that's like lipid is fuel so you'll burn that off and you'll actually maintain a lower weight and and your fasting lipid profile that I write for when you get your blood tested that will also improve with walking um, body weight obesity for the same reasons and interestingly it has other effects that are beneficial osteoporosis it's gonna get all of us because our bones are not getting stronger with age but how do you maintain it and keep it stronger osteoporosis just by loading on the ground you have to carry your whole body weight that actually strengthens the bones it keeps the bones a little denser for a longer period of time bone density will decline but this will help slow down that decline lead to less falls and fractures breast and colon cancer we still don't know why things like that are helped with walking but research is ongoing and probably more importantly all those things are great but you have to feel good about it so p when people go for a half hour walk or a one hour walk, you just generally feel good. It's studies are just being done They realize, you know, runners have known this for a long time, the runner's high. Whether you're 20 years old or, f or 70 years old, doing some level of activity, it releases all kinds of molecules throughout our bodies, our brains and nerves, endorphins, serotonins, all these things. It's kind of like our natural <laughs> high. It's the best way to get a natural high, you know, other than maybe caffeine. <laughs> or ginseng or something else that's legal. Um, so why, why is, you know, with the importance of walking, I'm gonna shift a little bit to the legs because it's extremely important. We often underestimate how important our legs and feet are because it's what keeps us standing. It's what makes us human and walk like other animals can't. The anatomy picture, as you know, legs have many parts and pieces. We learn all of this in medical school with bones, to support the weight and structure. Muscles, tendons, and ligaments they are kind of like pulleys and cords that make things move. Nerves, as you learned from the last lecture, are the electrical circuitry that go down and tell our legs what to do. Um, blood supply, arteries are going away from the heart, so in the legs, they're going down. And veins, they return the blood. Skin keeps it all wrapped up. It's also important because if, if all of that is not working properly your skin's going to start to show changes so one of the things that I do is treatment of venous insufficiency a little bit of a longer word not a common word but you can think of it as varicose veins that's one of the problems that people get as a result venous insufficiency here just shortened to VI here's just a simplified drawing of the leg this is the front of the leg 
obviously the knee, there's the back of the leg, hamstring and calf. The dark purple is the deep vein. Up here we call it the femoral vein, popliteal and calf veins. They branch off. And this one, the lighter color, is a superficial vein, the largest of which is called the great saphenous vein. For those of you who have had family members or know somebody that have had to have bypass surgery for the heart, the saphenous vein, the light blue superficial one, can actually be harvested and used in other parts of the body. So that taught us a long time ago that it's not an essential part of your leg, um, but it helps in the process. Now you can think of it, the veins in your leg, as just focusing on the veins as a tree, the trunk, and the branches. The dark blue one in the middle is the trunk of the tree. And obviously, you know, any gardener will tell you, you don't want to mess with the trunk of the tree if you want the tree to be around, which is the whole leg. But the superficial veins, they're branches. So if there's something going on with that, you can treat that, and we'll go into that a bit later. What's really interesting is that the saphenous vein, I mean, it's just like a miracle of the plumbing that's there in our leg that we don't even think about because we're born that way, we take it for granted. The saphenous vein and the deep veins, they have these interesting <coughs> little valves. They co -op. they touch like a sliding door and open up, but in a triangle-like way. The purpose of that is to keep the blood flowing up because there's no pump down there and we have to fight gravity. If, if there were no valves in our veins, all of our legs would be swollen just because of gravity at the end of the day. So when things are working normally, every, every four inches, four to five inches on all the veins, there are valves that are going up. Keep it going in a one way, kind of like a train track. Um, I tell people it's like lock gates in a canal going uphill. That's why the water's not all at the bottom. So in a healthy vein, blood goes up and the vein closes and the blood cannot fall back down. From conditions that lead to dilation of the vein or damage of the vein, you get this condition called reflux where the blood flows up and then unfortunately it slides back down also. So it's constant, it's happening every second. It's like timing, up, down. It's like, th it's like three steps forward, two steps back. Eventually the blood is making it up, but sluggishly. And that leads to problems. What do you feel when you have that? Because you can't see these valves. Um, we can see them with, with an ultrasound under the skin but you start to experience the veins on the surface, they get dilated because they're too plump with blood as the day goes on. You're standing, sitting. A lot of us have standing professions. I mean, we're humans, so we stand throughout the day. So you get varicose veins. You get pain in your legs. Pain kind of like this heaviness throbbing in the calf. Uh, gets worse as the day goes on. Some people have it so bad that it starts at like 10.30 or 11 in the morning, they tell me. They say, Doc, oh man, I have to sit down just by lunch and then I have to put my legs up. Um, or this term in the middle, venous claudication, describes when a couple is walking in the mall or the park or someplace and just legs are feeling like, literally like tree trunk heavy and say, you know what, I'm going to sit on this bench here for a little bit, try to get my legs up a little bit, you keep walking, I'll catch up. That's called venous claudication, which is different from arterial claudication. Arterial claudication, when you have blockages in the arteries, not this, not enough blood is going down. Not swelling, but it's actually not enough blood and oxygen. So as you walk, your muscles don't have enough energy to, um, that's, that's a burning exercise related. This is a heaviness and swelling. Your legs get restless at night. The muscles, the tissue, and the nerves, they're all in there they get bothered by this increased pressure that's been there all day long and it takes a while to decompress until you put your leg up maybe the first one or two hours of the night that you lay down it's slowly draining back in a good way but it's fidgety and, and it, it bothers the nerves. It can be, it can be. There's a couple of causes and I think the next slide I'll, I'll um, tackle that. The legs are heavy and fatigued if left alone, it'll start to change the skin. And advanced situations, you can get ulcers or bleeding problems from these superficial veins. Well, what are some of the simple things that we can all do? I tell people when you start experiencing these symptoms, moms in their 30s and 40s get it. Some people are fortunate and they get it later in their life. Whenever you can, obviously we can't be upside down. Uh, we're not bats, I tell people. I mean, bats will probably never have this condition. They probably have a headache all the time. But 
Keep your legs elevated when you can. Sofa, ottoman. Uh, when you're sleeping, keep your legs up on one or two pillows. Um, that'll help with the decompression. Obviously, it's better after waking up. It's like a Coke bottle. Coke bottle this way, and if you're laying down, the fluid will run back this way through the night. So it's better in the morning, and again, it starts all over again, and worse at the end of the day. Compression socks. I generally recommend, there's all types. Most common one is um, knee highs that just go to the top of the calf. Compression socks come in three different grades. There's mild, feels like a tight sock, um, like long sports socks. Moderate would be where you have to kind of fight a little bit to get them up. The hard part is getting them up around the toe and the ankle because there's a turn there but then, and, the, and the rest of it. The strong ones are definitely uh, too difficult to get on and I just generally recommend moderate ones if you can get them on or mild ones if you're having trouble. Now, it's not a must. Obviously, some people don't like the way they feel. It pinches at the top of the calf for some. There's a zillion different types out there. And now I tell patients that although your insurance may cover them, um, and people used to think that you had to go to a medical supply store to get it, um, it's easiest to go, guess where? Amazon. Yep, I heard Amazon a couple of places. Amazon's gonna supply us everything if you don't know that already, but. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's amazing because you can, when you punch it on there, I, I, you know, I unfortunately had a patient who, uh, I'm not going to name the medical supply store around here, had and went and they didn't, I, they probably know, but um, the patient was charged $143 for a pair and you can get a comparable um, pair for, now it's down as 15, somebody even said 10, 20, no more than $25. So yeah, so if always... Always price shop, whether you're buying stockings or something else. Um, and compression socks, now there's a couple of myths about them. People who have diabetes have this condition. And diabetic socks, I tried to look up the information, like the literature, on medical literature on diabetic socks. They tend to be looser. There's like a thin, soft weave, almost like a, um, a knitted kind of a, a feel. They generally don't have enough of a compression, a stretch. Uh, and people fear that if they put compression socks and you have diabetes or nerve conditions, you're going to make that worse. There is zero evidence to um, suggest that you're going to uh, hurt your circulation. It's the equivalent of somebody laying you down, putting your feet up on the top of the couch, on the other end of the couch, and massaging gently. Nurses in wound care centers will do this to get the fluid down. So this is kind of just a constant compression. It's hard to wear, obviously, in the summertime if you're going to wear shorts. And, 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 and slippers. They're not very sexy, obviously, but you can get them in purple, polka dots, barber pole stripes, whatever, because you've seen, you've seen young people that are, actually people are wearing them if you, pitchers in professional baseball wear arm compression sleeves. That's to drain the blood back faster so they can maybe pitch, I don't know, 100 pitches instead of 80 pitches um, because their arm is swelling up from constant activity. For the compression socks? Yeah, who's done studies on that? It's hard to. They don't have, the simple answer is no, they don't have studies. And it's hard to do in medicine, the, um, in Western medicine, the scientific approach for studies is called randomized controlled trials. So to really answer a question, do compression socks work or not work, you'd have to take at least 100, probably closer to 500 or more patients in one group and two separate groups. And you guys are going to wear compression socks at least three, four, five times a week for usually, it's got to be a longer period of time, one, two years or longer. And this group is not going to wear it. And you have to follow those two groups for a couple of years, and it's hard to do that. Um, it's hard to recruit. Right, but it's kind of an extension of. of of the drugstore too. You can get them at Rite Aid and, and uh, CVS and, and Walgreens. So it's when, when certain things are deemed, nothing is 100% safe. I tell, you know, there's no such thing as 100.0% safety for anything. Even Tylenol and aspirin and everything out there has warnings for kids and tamper resistance and stuff. But once something enters the space that it's safe enough, the FDA allows it to be put out there without a medical prescription. No, no, I've actually, uh, no, that's a very good question. I have actually, after, if you lose a toe, that's from arterial disease, that's not venous. 
Um, and then afterwards, after that's been taken care of, because that's a serious problem, if the patient can tolerate or somebody can put it on, we have had those patients who have this condition, say, in addition, this will not help the um, arterial disease where a diabetic loses their toe, called PAD, peripheral arterial disease, that is not helped by compression socks at all. But then if that person also has venous insufficiency, um, then yes, we have put compression socks on them. I've been doing this for six to seven years, and uh, literature and the meetings that I've gone to, they don't report that there's any harm. They've, there's a couple of trials based upon just limited populations, but it's not randomized where this group wore it and this group didn't for a bunch of years. It's usually small numbers, like 10, 20, 30 patients, and, and, they, and they end up in our medical journals as almost like anecdotal reports. But, but um, as long as you have a problem that warrants it, it's not going to fix other problems, such as arterial disease, or make it worse. <laughs> Once they took them off, there was. Oh, of course, yeah, right. This is not the only cause of swelling. Yeah. You do have to discuss with your primary doctor or your cardiologist uh, or someone to fi figure out before you just start tossing. Let's just go to Amazon and go get that for swollen legs. Now, if somebody has a problem from a medication side effect, amlodipine is a common blood pressure pill. Ten percent of people taking amlodipine will get leg swelling out of it. You shouldn't be wearing socks to get rid of that. It's not going to hurt you. You should be getting off the amlodipine and finding the right medication. So you've got to figure out other causes. So the most important thing is, is just like anything else, figure out what the cause of the problem is. And if there's a simple solution, go for leg elevation, change the medication. Um, if somebody has congestive heart failure and they're swollen, this is not, it's not going to hurt them but you really need to treat the congestive heart failure and get the water off them, diurese the patient. And, and uh, so I don't want this to be a substitute for, okay, just any cause of leg swelling, just put on compression socks and nothing else. But just specifically, assuming all the other things have been tackled and somebody has determined that this is venous insufficiency, varicose veins, then it certainly helps. They, from a scientific approach, veins, the pressure in the veins should be under 20. You can actually put a catheter in it and measure it. A column of water or millimeters of mercury, uh, like the old BP uh, cuffs that you squeeze and the, the mercury column rises. So our blood pressure takes a 120, if that's your blood pressure, millimeters of mercury pressure to occlude. And you know how tight that is. That's 120. It's the same pressure gradient. So veins, compression stockings, don't go more than 30 to 40. Mild is 10. Moderate is 15 to 20 in the 20 range, 30 or more. There's nothing out there more than 40. So you can't occlude arterial flow with just a soft squeeze of the blood pressure cuff. You'll still get this. You will just compress the superficial veins um, and not the deep veins, the um, light blue ones on the surface and not the deep veins. You can compress the deep veins. You've got to do this. You've got to really blow up the blood pressure cuff. Um, so the, um, a bit of a long answer to that, but yeah. How do you diagnose venous insufficiency, or you want to go ahead? Yep, I'll get to that, to that right there. Okay. There was another hand back. I was going to say that, um, I was told, especially when you take an airplane flight, yeah. you should take, use compression stockings. Yes, I tell that to my patients also, again, it's not a, studied, randomized kind of a thing. It's no harm to wear that. Um, there's no proof either way that it will prevent a blood clot um, or that you got a blood clot because you didn't wear it the other way around. Um, but there are cases, obviously, we see them periodically that somebody after a long flight, their legs will swell. And so just from a common sense advice, I just say that every couple of hours, whether you're in a long ride to Florida or wherever, or a long flight to international, um, or to the West Coast, get up every two hours and move around. Um, and the larger planes are designed to do that. Of course, you can't get exercise on that. Or when you're sitting to do toe exercises, that's kind of like a, a poor approximation of what your calf does when you have to walk. Just the action of the calf, what it does is it pumps the blood back up. There's no pump down there, but the walking is a, helps to pump the, the venous blood back up. And there's a hand at the back there. 
Yeah. Okay. Wearing it that long, you said? All day. No, typically the advice is for those who will benefit to take one step back, like you said, you got to get a, a history and physical and find out about the patient, their activity level, you're very active, medications, make sure it's not a side effect, other things. Once you've taken care of all of that, the general advice is to put it on in the morning um, and to wear it till the evening and to take it off. Um, so you don't have to wear it throughout the night. That's not where the problem is because gravity challenges as we're standing. Yeah. This is a little bit different now. I have a family member who is in the hospital and they put those leg massagers on. Yeah. He was laying down and then he sat in a chair for a while. And as he's sitting in the chair, I guess the fluid went down into the legs and all of a sudden his toes were turning blue. So obviously those leg massagers hold like a certain amount of pressure, but there still had to be significant amount of fluid to make his toes turn blue. So that isn't a venous problem, that's an arterial problem. No, the blue, the blue can be, it's, it's mostly, a, just a simple answer would be if it's just a pure, like purple, bluish, uh, cold. and cold color, it's, and there's swelling associated with it, uh, then you're usually dealing with the vein problem. The blue comes from the fact that your artery sends the blood down, and these veins with the valves are supposed to take them back up. When you're younger, they're not blue because they're coming back up. So now, if that's a problem where they're not coming up, too much blood is sitting down there. Blood that sits down there is not oxygenated. Oxygen has been taken off. Our lungs and heart oxygenate the blood and send them back down. So that's the furthest point away. So you're getting unoxygenated blood, which has a bluer tinge to it. Right, and if you're, if you're sitting, I tell the hospitalized patients or anybody to, to, to have some kind of compression on as much as they'll tolerate a sock wise. Right. You maybe have taken them off or turned them on or loosened them. You can, you can, you can, you can, you have to check to make sure it's not compressing it incorrectly. If you're just pinching at the ankle level and you're going to cause the toes to get puffy, then it could make the problem worse. But the compression massage, it's with air pumps and these pneumatic air pants, which you can actually get now at home if your insurance will cover it. And you wear them at home just like you have them in the hospital. It connects to an air machine like a blood pressure cuff to the wall. And for an hour or two, it's recommended those who have lymphedema and serious swelling problems, you're supposed to sit on a couch with your leg up while you're doing your crossword or whatever, watching TV, it pumps from the toe down. It has to be sequential. So, so someone needs to make sure that this is happening and not something wrong. And they actually help. They've been studied and shown to, that's, that's exactly what happens when somebody has lymphedema and has to go to a wound clinic. Uh, and there's a couple in the valley that they have to treat them manually. The nurses will put the leg up and massage it down. So I don't know if that specifically answered your question if, uh, if if the toe is turning blue, typically patients shouldn't be sitting upright, gravity down. The gra it, it, and well, it's wearing when they're wearing that. That's usually something when you're just bed. bed, sofa, couch at home, and then you take that off, put your sock on, and then you walk. Now, see, now I'm, James, I'm trying to compare that to a sock. Like if they had it put on properly while he's laying down, everything's good. He right. Sits up. Yeah, maybe it wasn't pumping, but still, it shouldn't get so tight that. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to overcome gravity. Yeah. <coughs> right. There's the challenge of gravity, meaning that you can't. The moment you stand and start walking again or sitting, um, gravity starts winning again with this whole thing. So you get them back up. You can't just be laying down the whole time because you have to get your physical therapy. You have to be up and walk. Um, but we look at it carefully to make sure, one, is it working? And two, I've had plenty of patients come to me as an outpatient saying, my feet get blue as I'm sitting, worse at the end of the day. And some amount of that we just have to kind of sort of put up with, meaning I can't, you, you can't cure that 100%. But we test for other things. If the arterial flow going down is normal, and there is, if there is venous insufficiency, I'll show in a couple of slides that we can treat that to make, make that situation better.
Diuretics are used to take water away, make you pee out extra. We have to use that with caution um, to make sure that we don't get an elderly patient dehydrated because it, di because it diureses the whole body. It's not the best approach, but sometimes you have to document all of this stuff before insurance will cover the next step if you um, qualify for, for a procedure. Pictures are worth a thousand words. So, legs of venous insufficiency. It's a progressive thing. It starts slowly. These pictures are a little bit more advanced, but I'm sure we all know somebody or have seen somebody either in front of you at the mall or at the beach. Uh, actually, at the beach, these are the people who wear the pants because they're shameful. I mean, nobody else really cares. Everybody knows that we have them, but chances are maybe that's the person who's got a leg that looks like that. Um, um, you get the bulging veins, thigh or calves particularly. You can get unilateral problems. It doesn't have to be both legs. It could just be this person's left leg is obviously more swollen than the right leg. And down by the bottom in the ankle area, you can see starting to get this purplish, tannish um, skin discoloration. And that's just from a chronic situation where too much blood is hanging out down there or the whole leg to the end of the day. The pressure here is the highest just gravity column. It's just a water physics situation. Um, some don't get swelling. Like on the left, you just get skin color. The skin gets a little firm, tan looking. Um, as it gets more advanced, it can feel like a, uh, a baseball glove. Um, if it gets more advanced, if you injure that and you get an ulcer, the ulcer for the same reason that the circulation is poor is not going to heal well. So we want to actually tackle the stuff before you get to this issue because then after the ulcer, you're at risk of getting infection and losing a, a toe or a foot and, and then it's a big problem. Does the size of your leg matter? In other words, if you have a thinner leg, are you less likely to have a problem than if you have a heavier leg? Or? No, no, we found no correlation, yeah. Mm -hmm. And towards that answer, the risk factors are, it's not just there's one reason why you get it or she gets it or he doesn't and he does. It's just a lot of things happen with age. We're standing. It's a wear and tear factor. The little valves, they weaken over time. Gender, there's a little bit more of a predominance in, in females, uh, probably from childbearing. Um, the pressure uh, that, that causes on uh, the pelvis weakens the veins um, later in life. Family history is a big factor. I've had plenty of people in their 20s and 30s who haven't had kids or whatever and they haven't been standing as long as somebody who's 60 and older come with these large varicose veins and says, oh, I had it when it was, I noticed it when I was 16 and it just started to get worse. And uh, um, family history is a big thing. And we don't know the genes that cause it, but it's very common. And it, it's not just girls in a family if the patient that I'm evaluating is female. I've seen it in both ways. I've had a young guy in his late 20s, three of his brothers and his dad, they're like longshoremen and stand, but not all longshoremen get it, but they're standing and everybody in their 20s and 30s have had it, just the guys, interestingly. So um, heavy lifting, uh, when you do that, you bear down, it puts more pressure inside the pipes. Interesting problem for weightlifters. A lot of weightlifters, young guys, usually young, who are like muscle and jacked and they're lifting a lot of weight, this, that heavy weight, they they show up and they have to have this problem taken care of because once that happens, it's not going to reverse itself. Multiple pregnancies, obesity puts pressure here for the same reason. Um, standing profession, whether you're a surgeon in an OR, um, nurse, a hairdresser, pen dot worker, it goes on and on and on. Uh, you know, uh, receptionist, it just, uh, that's a common problem. And if you have a history of blood clots, the blood clots can actually damage the veins inside the valves. And so the valves are not working. It's like a broken door. Um, and, and that'll lead to the same problem. I think somebody back there asked the question about how do we diagnose it. So first, I have to get that history from you, all those other slides, to see what, what may be your reason to have this and see how severe it is and what kind of symptoms you're having in your legs. And make sure it's not a side effect of other things, medications or CHF and other things, you know, um, kidney disease, liver disease, heart failure, other things can cause leg swelling. We have to make sure that you're medically treated for other things appropriately. And after that, that's a history and physical exam, that's a visit with me. A technician, like this picture here, will lay the patient down and scan the veins. The ultrasound is a neat, it's a very simple thing, but it's one of the most advanced things we have and there's no radiation. 
So you don't have to worry about that because it's used in moms and babies. And it can see up to 10 centimeters you know, through soft tissue. You know, it's remarkable that we've come to take for granted what we can see now just inside the body. And this is not something for you to look at, but this is what reflux is, is inside this vein, here's the skin on the top. The ultrasound probe is being held over here like that. And this is vein, and we can put color on it, this color bar over here, to show which way the blood's flowing. But once you actually map it physically, you can do a Doppler mapping at a point. The blood should be going, so that's towards the head. In a vein, it should be going back up. That's normal. The valve closes or tries to close. This is abnormal. So blood flows, and then as the valve tries to stay closed, you have a bunch of seconds. And we actually measure this. This is a time. Two, three, four seconds is falling back down. And that's, and that's how we diagnose it. And you have to have these criteria. Your vein has to be a certain size. It can't be smaller than a thin pencil. Um, the veins usually get dilated. Uh, they have to have reflux. You have to have the symptoms. And then what we do is we submit all of that, and it's covered by insurance, um, to see if you're a candidate for one of these treatment strategies. Uh, ablation is a general word. That just means, usually means doing some kind of a damage. Usually it's heat, but you can actually do cryoablation with freezing cold liquid nitrogen. Some kind of a heat or cold, here it's heat damage to any structure. You can ablate heart arrhythmias with a heat catheter. You can, here it's thermal ablation is the most common type. And what I've been doing for the last six, seven years is radio frequency, Medtronic makes this catheter, I'll show you a picture, called Closure Fast, through an IV technique, just like putting an IV in into your leg, just numb up the skin, go up, and you're awake for this. So it's a same day outpatient procedure. We go up the leg and the culprit vein gets burned and closed. The lidocaine injection, that's the ouch part of it. Lidocaine injection numbs it up so you don't feel the heat of the thermal ablation. And again, going back to branches of a tree, you're taking out a bad branch. The other branches take over. We're not in the deep veins. We make sure that you're not gonna get a DVT. We do a follow-up scan in a day or two after the procedure. Laser can be used for the same thing. There's a laser catheter. Laser, the tip of the catheter just heats up from laser. So heat is heat. It doesn't matter how you create it. It just effectively burns and scars the vein down. And over time, I tell people, think of your vein as like a rubber hose. Once you thermally ablate it, I've turned it into like, kind of like a nylon cord, less stretchy, kind of like a rope-like structure. In time, you can feel some discomfort and some tugging and pulling, but it does not affect your walking and daily function. You are good to go in a day or two of just, you get up and walk off the table uh, with a wrap on and you wear compression stockings for a couple of weeks and your body heals that scar down just like any other scar except it's a scar an inch under the skin. It'll go away, your body resorbs it in time. Chemical ablation is using a caustic chemical and there's a technique, there's a, uh, a company called, uh, um, well the company makes a catheter called Clarivane mechanochemical ablation is you put the catheter into the vein, the same technique, like a rotor rooter. I, it's, it's like snaking the plumbing. And that piece actually spins. There's a tiny motor on this outside end. It'll spin that. It scratches and ticks the vein off. And it's also putting in drip, drip through that same site of uh, sclerosant. Sclerosant is an FDA approved, being used since the 1970s, uh, to do sclerotherapy where it damages the inside of the vein and again down the road it'll collapse it. The goal is to close it down. There are two sclerosins commonly used, polydocanol and long word sodium tetradecyl sulfate, STS. They're just fancy clear dove solution things if you can think about it that way but just a gentler version of that used in the vein. Uh, risk of that is very low. It's been used for decades, longer than I've been a kid probably. So. Um, and larger veins, you can do sclerotherapy by watching where you are through an ultrasound guided. The spider veins, one you can easily see that are, tend to be more cosmetic, sometimes those don't get covered as well by insurance. If you just, are, if you just show up saying, oh, just get rid of this, and I, my legs don't bother me at all, chances are that won't get covered, but it's not expensive either. And we do that also. There, you can just inject them directly with the sclerosin right through the skin. There's a new technology that's just been approved in January 2018. Uh, the FDA approved Medtronic came up with Venaseal, 
they have to come up with a better term than non-thermal, non-tumescent, non-sclerosant, because it's none of these, but they haven't come up with an easier term for it. It's using actually super glue <laughs> inside your vein. And we've known for some period of time that super glue is safe um, because when kids get cuts in certain parts of the body, like a scalp, and it's hard to stitch, it's easier for everybody to just put a little super glue on, bring the two edges of the cut together, and just put like a band-aid on top. Your body does the healing. The super glue's job is just to keep things like this um, close together. So they've come up with a new formulation of uh, cyanoacrylate is the chemical name of this, that, that it's safe. It's like putting a caulk gun inside the vein now and just filling it with caulk, if you think, on the way back. It's like, um, and there's been no problems with DVTs, which are blood clots, uh, strokes, or any reaction. You know, other surgeries, you have people have implants, knee implants, hip implants, plastic surgical implants, other things have been implanted in the body. So you can think of it as an implant designed to just shut the vein down. We'll be um, doing that shortly in the near future at, at, at Coordinated Health. There's no one else in this area that has tackled that yet. Yes? Yes, sclerosin has that same root word, but what you're doing is you're scarring a vein internally. So no external scars. Um, surgical stripping, I'm sure you've heard, is an old-fashioned approach. It took a while. You had to make one-inch cuts like a ladder every four or five inches, one, two, three, four, and get under the skin and by hook or by crook literally just take the vein out. Uh, restitch those cuts because that's a big cut and then your leg got wrapped up and you were black and blue for weeks and I've had patients said oh I had my leg done in 1970 I had my left leg done and uh, they're coming to me for the right leg I said I never went back for the right leg because it's just it's just a long healing process and it's a surgery that's not necessary as much anymore so what the uh, equipment looks like this is a this is the heat generator to the catheter part of the catheter is cut off the tip of the catheter here is a seven centimeter element that heats up through microwave. That's radio frequency. So the most common use of, micro, of, of radio frequency is, is your microwave in your house. So that's why you're not supposed to stick a spoon in the, in the cup in there because it heats up, sparks, risk of fire. So that's a controlled way of creating heat using microwave. Um, any kind of catheter can get put up. This is like, let's call it the glue gun. With the, through a long skinny tube, this is a vial with a needle that draws up the super glue and we put it into the back end of this and through the tip of the catheter we can see on the skin here's an ultrasound probe we can push with an instrument or a finger and see that we're in the right location we stay out of the deep vein you do not want to cause a blood clot there here's a superficial vein oops we just partial loss of power I guess I don't know if that's a Oh, maybe just somebody is. No problem. And we're getting close to the end. The uh, relief of symptoms. A minute warning. Yeah. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, you get quick relief of symptoms. As I said, outpatient. Venus seal is actually even faster. It's like they're going to try to advertise it as a two-hour procedure you can do during your lunch break. Put your stocking on and go back to work or <coughs> golfing or whatever. Um, and um, it can be done under local anesthesia. And normal activities after one or two days, um, no heavy lifting for a week or so, good cosmetic outcome, which is nice, but also the relief of symptoms, and it's covered by insurance. So you want to look like this couple as you age, stay active, have legs that feel lighter, less pain and fatigue, and less swelling. And just a couple more pictures. It's nice when the leg goes from the one on the left to the one on the right, but it's also associated with the patient is, is, is very happy that they don't have all that hurting and burning. So call for evaluation, and uh, this looks like the last slide, there's just two more slides after this uh, for venous insufficiency treatment, and just as a reminder, I am a board certified cardiologist. We have a couple of cardiologists at Coordinated Health, and we handle all this other stuff too. Um, I was talking to somebody about palpitations, arrhythmias, AFib, coronary disease, heart failure, valvular. We do all the echo stress testing, all the types of stress testing and procedures. Now, we don't have a cardiac catheterization lab or open heart surgeon, but if you need that, if we find a problem, you go to the place of your choice and we refer to all of the hospitals in the area um, if you need something uh, that is more involved. 
And just as a reminder, I don't know if, you know, if some of the speakers went into this uh, you know, earlier, coordinated health was known for many years for its orthopedic um, um, skills and as a top-notch orthopedic center. But you have primary care, you have women's health, you have endocrine. I know I'm going to leave groups out. You have um, uh, many different groups that can handle all this other stuff that just to not lose track of your vascular stuff and get a consultation uh, from everything from GI, colorectal cancer, diet. We're going to be developing uh, weight loss. As you know, weight's a big problem. There is a bariatric program that's, that's now on board and getting started. Um, and all this other screening stuff that everybody needs as we get older um, can be done, and particularly the screening directed towards women um, and the prevention of certain types of cancer and osteoporosis. So thanks for your time.